Thanks. Great. My pleasure. Wow. Hello. Yeah, we got a whole full house for you. Chris, you have lived an amazing life and you've put it all down in this great book, A Guide to Life. You're, you're done going to space for now, but now you love being a space educator. Yeah. Why? I've been speaking in schools all around the world, but uh, across Canada for 25 years and trying to not just talk about the fun stuff that we do in space, but get into why and where it leads us and what perspectives it, it, it gives us. And so uh, I've loved the things I've got to do at a personal level, but I really think the, uh, the sharing side of it and, and the educational side of it is, is the best uh, long-term benefit. And we've just finished a year of, we, not we, but they have just finished a year of studying your hip bones. Yeah. This is gonna help us all with aging, I understand. What did we learn? It's, it's really interesting, as, especially as the average age within the population uh, gets older, as we found ways to keep people alive longer and longer. So our older population is a bigger percentage uh, of everybody. Um, it's really important to understand how the body ages. And what's interesting on a spaceship is uh, the things that happen naturally when you live in weightlessness are a real interesting parallel to what happens to your body as you age. Your balance system degrades, your bones become less dense, your muscles weaken, your blood pressure regulation uh, goes kind of haywire, your immune system is depressed. All of those things happen simultaneously and they happen fast and they all happen naturally. And so it's a great way for our doctors and biomedical researchers to kind of look at like accelerated aging and when we come back, they reverse. So to try and understand why my osteoporosis, my uh, loss of bone density happened and then how it reversed, if we can look at how the body controls all wow. those things, wow. then we can start applying it to the whole population at large and the Canadian Space Agency and universities across the country, University of Waterloo, they're studying just those issues to try and understand it better. Why does it have to be tested in space so it can be invented here on Earth? Well, some of the things we take advantage of being there. For example, all of those medical changes that I talk about, they occur because of weightlessness. It, it's why you build a laboratory anywhere. You build a laboratory to change something under a controlled set of circumstances, you know, like you raise the temperature or the pressure or, or, or something, so then you can study it better. When we take a human body to space, it has rapid changes uh, completely because of weightlessness, because of the removal of gravity. And those are what allow us to study aging. We have to have a little bit of fun here because there's a lot of curious questions and we're gonna hear from some of these great faces in a great. moment. But first of all, we wanna know this, are you a Star Trek or a Star Wars kind of guy? These are quick answers, you don't have to really think lots of them. Star Wars or Star Trek guy? Star Trek. Best food to eat in space? Mm, something sticky. Okay. <laughs> Pluto, a planet or not? It's not. Okay, is there a Tim Hortons? I feel to bad for Pluto, but, but, it's, <laughs> it's, but not a it's not. <laughs> okay. Is there Tim Hortons to drink on the International Space Station? Yes, and uh, the How? Russians on board, uh, they, they, they loved the Tim Hortons coffee we had on board, and they called everything else deputy coffee. Deputy <laughs> coffee. I want Tim Hortons. Deputy. <laughs> coffee. Everything else, deputy coffee. Okay, deputy. Okay. So are you brewing it or are you putting like curing? No, it in? has to be instant. It's just it's in, instant. in pouches. But yeah, all of our coffee is instant on board. But there, there's such thing as good instant and bad okay. instant coffee. Okay. Yeah, and you guys know how to make it up there. Okay. Over 24 million people have watched this video that we too have wrestled for a little bit of the rights to watch. Okay. Take a look at this. Ground control to Major Tom. Commencing countdown engines on. Okay, you know exactly how many seconds we can play. You no, I, there's a countdown <laughs> in the background of the song. Okay. One of your uh, fans who watched that is actually the astronomer to the Pope. I didn't even know the Pope had an astronomer, but he we're going to hear more from him in a moment. So Guy Consolamona has a question for you about that song. Listen here to the astronomer of the Pope. Did you actually find any difficulty playing a guitar in zero gravity? <laughs> okay, that was Chris. not the question I expected from the astronomer to the Pope. <laughs> so playing guitar without gravity is both easier and harder. Uh, 
for, for folks that play guitar, the guitar is heavy, of course, and so you either sit and, and prop it on your knee, and that's why the guitar has the cutout of that part to fit around your knee, or if you're standing, of course, you wear a strap around your neck. Both of those things hold the guitar nice and stable, but it's kind of a pain, the weight of the guitar. Uh, but they make the guitar stable, so when you fret up and down the neck or you're working away here, the, the guitar um, doesn't need to be held anywhere. When you get to weightlessness, you don't have to deal with the weight of the guitar. It doesn't pull your neck down. But when you move your hand up the neck, the guitar just takes off the other <laughs> way. And, and so uh, I had, had to learn how to sort of, uh, if you watch during Space Oddity there, I, um, I always have it sort of snugged under my right bicep to hold the guitar still while I'm playing it. It's, otherwise, it just, it, imagine if you're playing guitar floating in a swimming pool. It's sort of like, like that sense of, of aimlessness, and you have to relearn how to play it. You made a big deal about this in the book, that you've got to set goals, you've got to have a focus. Um, how, how important has that been for you to, to set a dream? You started this when you were nine years old, and we got some nine-year-olds in the audience. I was the age of a, of a cub uh, or a brownie when I, when I decided to be an astronaut. I was inspired by other people, as most of us are. I was inspired by some adults that had... Uh, that were some of the very first to go to space. And, and the, the two specifically that walked on the moon were the summer that I turned 10. And um, they gave me an enormous gift, which was uh, uh, an invitation to do something that was uh, previously impossible. It is a wonderful gift to learn as a 10-year-old kid that impossible things happen. And they don't happen necessarily randomly, and they don't happen um, because they have to, they happen because people work really, really hard and because they just barely can. But the impossible things happen. And life is about the choices you make every day. Yep. That is your life. And so that is the beauty of having a long-term goal, is it allows you to choose what you want to do every single day. But you have fierce short-term goals too. Your, your book, you outline really, you are all about a really focused determination to get to that long-term goal, right? Sure, but I think the, the important balance to that is at no point was I going to say to myself, I'm a failure if I don't get to do that impossible distant thing. That's the lure and the, and the draw and the distant uh, plan of my life, but I'm going to love the heck out of what I'm doing today. And by the end of today, I want to feel like I had a really successful and interesting day. And, and I met some people and I got to think of some things and see some things. That, that are new to me and, and treat every single day like that. And maybe someday also command a spaceship. I think we've got some, some children's questions for you right now here. Were you ever a cub? I was a cub in, in uh, Milton, Ontario, and my mom drove me there. I think it was every Tuesday night. We met at the, um, the Milton Fairgrounds, and uh, I learned do your best, do our best, dib, 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 dob, 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 Akela will do our best. And, uh, I went to a cub camp, and I made a wolf's head once out of plaster, and then I painted it, and I had that in my bedroom for my whole life. I learned a lot. I got several badges also um, when, I, when I was a cub. I think cub's a great organization. Is there not like a one in 34 chance of catastrophic disaster on the ISS? Uh, on my first, actually, the space station's pretty safe. Uh, launch is dangerous. Uh, riding a rocket ship. I've flown three different rocket ships. The space shuttle twice, the Soyuz once. We got better at flying the space shuttle over time. We learned a lot. But on my first flight, now that we look back, the odds of everybody dying in the first nine minutes was about one in 35 or one in 40. So that's the number in the first nine minutes. Um, so your job is not to sit there and, and shiver like a chihuahua with your fingers crossed, if that doesn't if mix my metaphors too badly. Um, <laughs> uh, but your job is to survive. Your job is to make that machine do the things that optimize your chances to get there. And, and uh, that's what we train so much and prepare so much for. So we're not afraid of it. We're eager to get it. It's like a test. You're terrified if you come into a test and you don't know what you're doing. But if you know every single question you can be asked and you've practiced the answers a thousand times, the test isn't scary anymore. You're just kind of eager to get at it. Visualize and practice. And that, that is what really makes the difference.